Hello, family. We really need to thank God and his good providence that he has given us this means to communicate, even though it might not quite be as personal as we'd like. Uh, the fact that we can do this and that I can bring this lesson from the comforts of my bedroom, even though it is in isolation, we give God the glory and the credit and the praise. And uh, we're hopeful that this lesson is going to be beneficial uh, to all that will hear it. Uh, a few things that we want to uh, make known uh, before we begin our study of the book of Philippians. So I hope you will get your Bibles out. We're going to do an expository study and I hope you will follow along as we study that great book of joy. Uh, but first we wanna mention uh, congratulations to uh, Kevin and Michaela Kennedy on the birth of their daughter, Brinley Ray. She was born on March 27th, and uh, Amelia uh, is ready to take over the reins of uh, Big Sister, and we certainly send our congratulations to that, uh, that wonderful family. Congratulations are also in order to Justin and Emily Heydrich on the birth of their son, Bo Charter Heydrich. He was born uh, just a couple of days ago on April 4th, and of course, Maggie is the big sister, and Guy and Loretta Heydrich are the proud uh, spoilers. Congratulations also in order to Robert and Nancy Phillips. They are celebrating number 50, their 50th anniversary together. And that will be on Sunday, April the 12th. And I need to ask Robert if there's any irony at all to the fact that he is going to celebrate his 50th wedding anniversary in isolation, in a type of prison. Now, I'm not necessarily implicating Nancy in any way, but uh, just a question that, that crossed my mind. And uh, we're so grateful for their lives together and the great influence that they've been on the cause of Christ uh, for many years, and we want to thank them. Please keep in mind also that the Woodstock Church of Christ now has a method for online giving. And uh, that app is called GiveLify, and you can download that um, uh, on your phone or tablet, laptop or desktop, or you can use it online and it allows you uh, to make your offering and for that offering to be transmitted directly to the church bank account. Uh, all by the click of a button. Again, we're grateful to God and his great providence that he makes this available to us. If your uh, bank has online bill pay, uh, that is a convenient way to uh, transfer funds as well. Uh, if you just have an envelope and a stamp, that still works. Uh, as far as I know, the Pony Express, the United States Postal Service is still up and running and uh, you can implement that way to, uh, to make your contribution. The important thing is that we want to make every effort possible to send our contributions in on a weekly basis, if at all possible, uh, in accordance with 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Uh, Chris and I actually do our uh, uh, online bill pay through our bank, and when we are having our worship service, uh, on Sundays, we actually click the button to submit our contribution as if we would be putting it in the plate. Uh, we certainly understand if economic hardships may preclude some from uh, contributing weekly, but please try, if at all possible, to do that on a weekly basis and not necessarily to be saving it all up and giving one lump sum when we get back. I mean, that's better than nothing, but... Uh, we need to understand that the church has its weekly and bi-weekly uh, obligations as well. And so anything that you can do along those lines would certainly be beneficial. And your understanding in this matter, as well as your typical Woodstock spirit of giving and the good attitude that always accompanies those gifts, uh, always has been and always will be loved in a, and appreciated. Please continue to remember our food providers. Uh, Frank and Glenda at the Frosty Frog. You can call in your order or place it online and the waitresses will bring it right out to you at curbside and they will be smiling and they will be friendly 
and um, the Frosty Frog is open 7.30 nightly and till 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. And Chris and I really look forward to the end of the day and making a little trip up there and visiting and, and getting to uh, uh, see uh, those that work at the Frosty Frog and uh, appreciate the opportunity that we have to help them. Also, Jeremy and Shauna are taking orders uh, on Wednesday. And uh, if you can get those orders in uh, by calling Jeremy or Shauna, telling them your order. Uh, in fact, uh, you'll have time to do that if you're listening to this uh, recording uh, at five o'clock or a little bit after, you'll have time to call them and put your order in for uh, ribs or brisket, wings, uh, and they would ha be happy to take that order. You go pick it up on Friday evening uh, between 4.30 and 6 or 5 and 6.30, uh, you can, uh, pick those up then. And I'll tell you, last week, uh, we ordered brisket and it was delicious. So, uh, remember all of our members, not only our food service providers, but anyone else who might be able to provide us services, uh, during this time of, uh, lockdown. And let's help our own first. Let's take care of our own. Uh, especially those of the household of faith. We want to keep in mind also our active health care workers who are uh, going in every day and uh, or every other day as the case may be and uh, being in direct line with those who might be contagious, uh, those who are actually going into the rooms of patients that have been infected with the virus and and all of uh, the support staff that have to go into those buildings and uh, work in hospitals or doctor's offices and the like. Um, we have some of those that, uh, that we're going to mention and if there are any others that belong on this list, uh, we want you to, uh, to call Ellen and we'll get those put on the list and we want to remem remember them specifically in prayer. Uh, Shannon O'Dell, Natalie Vetrano, Kelly Lindsay, Chris Amos, Emily Heydrich, Ann Dominguez, Chris Dodson, and Rhonda House. Uh, and we'll pray for them in just a moment and uh, pray for other things that we need to pray for during this uh, turbulent time. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and do that now, and then we'll begin our study. I, I have listed a number of things here that we need to keep in mind as we remember those who are uh, currently on the front lines and those who are suffering some hardship because of this virus. And we want to remember these sentiments and, and keep them before the throne of God uh, as much as we can. So let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for the blessings that you give us. We're thankful for the Bible and for the comfort and the encouragement that it gives. Father, uh, especially at this time, we're thankful for the book of Philippians. And as Paul was in isolation, as he was in prison, the spirit that he maintained, the desire to serve you, to teach your word, to actually write your word, uh, is a great encouragement to us. And we pray, Father, that we'll emulate his attitude and and truly, in every state that we find ourselves, we'll be, we will be content. Father, we pray for those who are sick and, in, uh, and infected by this virus. And, and, and Father, we pray that you would heal them, help them sustain their bodies and their uh, spirits. And we pray that uh, you would contain the spread of this infection. Uh, for our more vulnerable populations, Father, we pray that you would protect our elderly and those who are suffering from chronic disease. Father, we pray that you would be with those especially who are poor, the uninsured, and Father, we pray that they will be taken care of in this situation. For the young and the strong, we ask that you would give them the necessary caution and wisdom to keep them from unwittingly spread uh, this disease. And we pray, Father, that you would inspire all of us to, uh, to be good citizens and to be good citizens not only of this country, but uh, of the world and especially of your kingdom. Father, we pray for our local, state, and federal governments and all of our elected officials as they pertain to uh, this situation. And Father, we pray that 
they would allocate just the right resources necessary for combating the, the, parademic, uh, the pandemic. And we pray, Father, that, uh, uh, that more tests could be provided and given that would give us a more accurate account of what's happening. And Father, for those in the scientific community, we, we pray for them and uh, as they lead the charge to understand this disease and, and communicate its gravity. And Father, we pray for them knowledge and wisdom and a persuasive voice. And for all those that are communicating that message, Father, for the media committed to providing up-to-date information, we pray that they will communicate that with a balance of seriousness and um, and optimism. And Father, we pray that you would calm them in, in, in a, in a panic-laden situation. And for all of those, Father, that tune in, we, we pray that we will be well informed and, and that uh, we would do all things necessary. Father, most importantly, that the gospel could still be spread even during uh, this time. Father, for so many blessings, we give you thanks. And Father, we pray that you would be with all of us that are trying to teach and to preach during this time. We pray that these challenges of social distancing would, would not be a big impediment for the gospel going forth. And, and Father, we pray for uh, our elders. We pray for them wisdom, and we pray that they would make the proper decisions during this time for our congregation that would be most beneficial. Father, for every Christian in every neighborhood and community and city, we pray that we will be inspired and encouraged by your word. And even during these times when we can be together to, to gain the most from them, that we can be the most useful in your service. God, keep us safe and healthy as you see fit. Keep all those that are less fortunate healthy. And Father, we pray at the end of this, we'll be able to see your great wisdom and all of the good that we know you'll bring from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for uh, that prayer, for uh, being a part of it. And I hope you're ready to study this great book. Uh, this, this book of Philippians, I believe, is so appropriate for our time. Uh, because as we said, it has to deal with uh, uh, Paul being thankful and having the spirit and, and, and being content to, uh, to bless uh, fellow Christians in a time uh, when he was incarcerated. He was in prison. He was in isolation. And in this book of, really it's an informal letter, and Paul is thanking them for the encouragement they've been to him, the help that they've administered to him in spreading the gospel. And this is basically a thank you note. It's a thank you letter from prison to this great church for all that they have meant to him. And if there was anyone truly, other than the Lord himself, to be able to say whatever state you find yourselves in to be content, in this setting, it would be the Apostle Paul. And if there was ever a setting in which you and I should look to be receiving this message, it's in a time of isolation. So I want you to uh, open your Bibles quickly to Acts chapter 16 as we study, uh, as we begin our study of the book of Philippians. As you know, uh, the book of Philippians was written from a Roman prison, Paul's second uh, imprisonment at the end of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28. But he establishes the church in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Now I want to, before we delve into that chapter, I want us to ask a question here. Is the book of Philippians about joy or is, a, is it about Jesus? Well, of course, the... Uh, the astute student will say it's about both. We commonly say that this is a book about joy, and the word joy appears no less than 19 times, depending on the translation that you're using, 19 times within these four chapters. But did you know that the word Jesus, or its equivalent, is used more than 40 times? 
Usually we don't get that part of the story when we're talking about this book of joy. And the theme of the book of Philippians is certainly about joy. The joy that the Lord gives no matter what the situation is in life. But when we think about joy and Jesus, can we even really separate the two? When we think about God and love, you know, we sing many times, God is love. But when we think about Jesus, Jesus is joy. Jesus spent his lifetime spreading joy to a lost and dying world and primarily bringing to them salvation in which there's ultimate joy. Now, many of a worldly mindset need to be converted uh, to this idea and to the principles of how we obtain joy. Sometimes it doesn't come in ways we think, like maybe during isolation, during a type of maybe spiritual imprisonment to where we think our joy is robbed. But you know, joy is something that is deeper than a surface happiness. Happiness is, uh, is temporary. You know, in our lives, how many times have you been happy and how many times have you been sad? Plenty of times with each. And they change. And many times those, those things change with our moods. But when we talk about joy, that is something. Heartfelt joy. The joy that God gives comes from deep within us. And that is something that doesn't change even as those things around us change. Do you find joy in the middle of a difficult situation difficult? Do you find it hard to be of genuine joy when you're in a bad mood? You see, many times this is where optimism and pessimism comes. You know, we can still be optimistic in a not so good situation. If we understand who is in control, if we understand upon whom we are dependent, if we understand what the true philosophy and the true nature of the Christian life is all about, then we can, like the Apostle Paul say, in the midst of containment, confinement, I can find myself joyous. I can be content. When, I, when you think of contentment, you don't necessarily think of necessarily happiness or something that's external. When you think of contentment, the very idea inherent in that word contentment is something that's down deep in our spirits. It's not a surface kind of consideration. Uh, we're going to learn this from the book of uh, Philippians and this faithful letter that Paul wrote to this great church about true joy and how it comes only when we humble ourselves in the hands of God and we believe in the saving work of Jesus Christ, not just as he saves us initially, but how he continues to save us and keep us, keeping us saved through times of confinement, through times of sadness and the things that this world brings. The epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians as we said, is one of the prison epistles. He wrote it from a Roman prison in Philippi, and this is one of four what we have entitled prison epistles that Paul wrote. The others were Ephesians and uh, Colossians and Philemon. This letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians was written to the believers in Europe, and in the city of Philippi. And this letter comes out of a wonderful relationship that Paul had established with the church and the church with Paul. And it seems as if Paul was closer to this church than in any, to any other church that he wrote. Their love for him and his love for them is clearly mirrored in this epistle. And this epistle deals with Christian experience at the level on which all of us as Christians should be living. Now, all of us aren't. All of us have not reached this level to where we can be joyous whatever happens to us. 
You see that we can have like a forgiving spirit, even in the cases when we are carrying our cross, as Jesus did and, and was hanging on, on a cross. It's not a level uh, on which all of us are, but we should all desire to be there. And that's the level where God wants us to be. What an opportune time. What a great opportunity we have right now as we're able to focus on this and have more time to do so of being content wherever we find ourselves. Well, Paul visited Philippi on his second missionary journey. And you'll recall that he and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey to the Galatian area, uh, specifically to the southern part of Galatia, where they had a wonderful relationship with each other, and they founded many congregations in spite, again, here's this theme again, of the persecutions that they encountered. Well, Paul wanted to visit these churches on his second missionary journey, and he wanted to take Barnabas with him again. But Barnabas was insisting that uh, they should take John Mark, his nephew, with them. And you'll recall that on the first miss missionary journey, John Mark left them. Uh, obviously for reasons that the Apostle Paul didn't think were appropriate, uh, and we could uh, guess what those reasons might have been, but he left them, and uh, Paul was not necessarily in agreement of taking uh, John Mark with him. Well, Barnabas insisted, so the great missionary team of Paul and Barnabas uh, were split, no doubt, according to the providence of God, or at least God taking this situation and bringing his providential will about. So uh, John Mark went with Barnabas, and Paul now teams with a man by the name of Silas. And so they went on the rest of this journey, and it would seem that Paul intended to widen his circle of missionary activity in that area, because where uh, Paul and Silas were going was a, uh, a great population and it was highly civilized. Do you remember Paul was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles and he would go before kings and, and leaders of nations, which he did. He appeals to Caesar and it was going to take someone like the apostle Paul and his background who was... Uh, a great student himself, and uh, it was it was very, no doubt, providential that uh, that the Lord would use the Apostle Paul and the split in missionary teams here to accomplish His purpose in this great Roman culture and in the city of Philippi. Uh, Doctor Luke, in recording all this, says that Paul attempted. At this time, in Acts chapter 16, in the second missionary journey before going to Philippi, uh, to go into the south, uh, into Asia, uh, when the Bible uses the word Asia, it doesn't always mean the continent, but here again, as, as uh, the scriptures teach in the book of Revelation, this is uh, Asia Minor. Uh, Ephesus was one of the leading cities here. But when Paul attempted to go south, the Spirit of God, the Bible says, put up a roadblock. Well, since he wasn't to go south, Paul thought then he would go north, where today we call that part Turkey. But the Bible says that uh, they planned, the old King James says, a sade to go into Bithynia, Guess what happened in Acts chapter 16 here in verse 7? The Spirit suffered them not. So the roadblock was put up to the south. The roadblock was put up from the north. And he came from the east. So there was only one place to go. They were going to go west. And they were going to go as far west as Troas. 
to go any further. He would have to go by boat. So Paul was kind of waiting for instructions from God. And you know, sometimes we feel that God must lead us immediately. But sometimes we need to sit and wait upon God. Oh, if God would give us our answers and provide things for us right when we think we would need them, I wonder what kind of shape we would be in. Let's wait on God sometimes. Let's understand the best we can his will, and he'll make that known to us. But here, the, the voice of God was indicating to the proverbial voice, to Paul and Silas, go west, young men, go west. So the gospel goes west. And we need to appreciate this because this is the first time uh, that the gospel is going into Europe. Well, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of influence from Europe in our country, right? This country was founded upon Europeans coming here for the number one reason of uh, liberty in their expression of religion and worship. So in a very real sense, when the gospel comes to America, it went west. Just as Paul and Silas would be receiving the Macedonian call to come help us. They were going west. And many times we sing the song, don't we? We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light. Send the blessed light of the gospel. Some have suggested that we ought to change that word of sending to take it. Take the gospel. Take the gospel. We have heard the Macedonian call. And you know, all of us proverbially have heard that Macedonian call. And are we cognizant of the fact of taking it when we have opportunity? You know, I'm able here from, from my bedroom to look out at windows. And I look at the house in one direction, a neighbor's house. I look at another neighbor's house. I look to my left and I see two other neighbor's houses. And you know what I hear? I hear the Macedonian call. Come help me. Oh, but I'm in isolation. Oh, well, so was Paul. So was Paul later when he would write the letter. But you know, Paul was in isolation at other times and he was still receiving the call. And we're going to see in this chapter, as the church at Philippi was established, that even though he was in incarceration, he and Silas were teaching and singing the gospel of Christ. And it caused those around them, namely a Philippian jailer, to ask the world's greatest question. What must I do to be saved? And you know what? If we take advantage of this isolation, there will be people, even if it's our own children, to ask us what we can do to be saved. We can pick up the phone in isolation and be reading a part of scripture or teaching a part of scripture, much of like we're doing today. And we're answering the Macedonian call to help us with the gospel. Well, Paul continued to wait in the city of Troas. Perhaps we know this city uh, more from the name of Troy. And he got his orders and he was given this Macedonian a call and he responded to it. And so the gospel was first preached in Asia, but this wasn't the second continent that the gospel would be, would be taken. Do you remember the second one was Africa? When back in Acts chapter eight, the Ethiopian eunuch obeyed the gospel and no doubt went back to the shores of Africa and perhaps even beyond and the gospel went into Africa but now it's going to Europe. So Paul and his companions boarded a ship that took them to Europe. And this is a great crossing because the gospel now is being as Acts chapter one and verse eight said to the apostles that they would be witnesses of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and now when? To the uttermost parts of the earth. And it's happening now as it goes into the continent of Europe. So Paul crosses over and his first stop was the city of Philippi. 
And the Bible says, look at Acts chapter 16. Let's look beginning at verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. We've talked about that. They came to Mysia. They tried to go into Bithynia. That was to the north, but the Spirit didn't permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and here's the vision. It appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately... We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel. Now, it would have been, it would have been nice to have had the details of that vision, exactly how it came, what it was. We don't have those details. Obviously, we didn't need them. But we see where Paul clearly understood that the Lord wanted, wanted them to go into Macedonia. So verse 11, they sailed from Troas. We ran a straight course to Samothrace and the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city in the part of Macedonia. It was a Roman colony and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, notice that this was not the typical uh, first day of the week worship. They were going uh, to talk to people when they were worshiping. And many of them were still worshiping on the Sabbath day. And they went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. Notice that there was a specific time for prayer. And I hope that's ca the case with all of us. Yes, we have a specific time of prayer in our corporate worship, but now we can focus on with our families a particular time of prayer for our families as we worship. Do you have a particular time that you pray? I mean a particular time for prayer specifically like a clock hour, not just a, a general, well, we pray before we, we pray, but we have a particular time that's, that's commonly held as prayer time. That's a good way to keep, keep that ever before us and, and to be encouraged by that time and looking forward from day to day to a particular time when we talk to God specifically and not just in a general way when we, when we pray for food or, or, or the like. Well, the Sabbath day they came to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and noticed to whom they spoke first of all, women. Women. Women play an integral part in congregations of the Lord's people. In fact, in Philippi, women were basically going to be the ones that begin the church at Philippi. Now, it's interesting to note that women play a part when Paul wrote the letter to Philippi. In fact, there was only one negative thing said in that whole book of Philippians. And it was two women who were arguing in the beginning of chapter four, but we'll get to that, Lord willing, later on. But these women were not arguing, they were worshiping. They were, they were doing the will of the Lord and they had good hearts. And the Bible is going to say here that the Lord is going to open the heart of a woman by the name of Lydia. Look in verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. You know, there are people with good hearts that worship God that might not be doing that correctly. You know, Lydia had to be converted. Lydia had to understand what salvation was even all about. You know, the indication here, yes, this was the Sabbath day, but... She was probably worshiping here and these ladies were worshiping here as their corporate worship. This wasn't private worship. And so they needed to be taught the way of the Lord more perfectly. So that was going to happen. But they needed to become Christians. And the Bible says in verse 14 that the Lord opened her heart. Now, how did the Lord do that? Do you know the Lord opens hearts and the Lord also closes hearts? 
The Lord has done this to many people and he still does it today. But that doesn't mean that he necessarily takes away their free choice or their free will. That doesn't mean that he blocks their mind and, and, and will not prohibit them from obeying the gospel. No, as the gospel goes forth, it is going to uh, attract people, but it will also repel people. That's the nature of the gospel. There has to be a, a good heart, good soil. You know, the seed will fall on bad soil. The seed will sow on good soil. When it comes to choice and when it comes to attitude, that is what we bring to the table. What God brings to the table through the word of God and through others is the gospel. Now, some good hearts will accept that. In the general overall idea of that, God, through instrumentality, opens hearts. But God, in a general way, as that is rejected by man's freedom of choice, it can be said that God hardens hearts. But no one's free will whosoever will let him come let him take of the uh, of the of the tree of life freely let him let him take of the water of life out of which uh, living waters will eventually flow from him as he takes the gospel to to the world but let it never be thought that God takes away someone and that he has died that Jesus has died only for the elect and God has somehow predetermined each person's individual salvation or condemnation. God does not do that, and his word does not teach that. Uh, Lydia's heart, her mind, her spirit was receptive, and so the Lord opened her heart in order to receive the word of God, and we pray uh, as he does that today that we will heed the Macedonian call to place the gospel into those good and honest hearts. Do you remember when God wanted Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites? Well, Jonah didn't want to go. He, didn't, he assumed that they all had bad hearts and there was no one there to put the seed of God's word into their hearts. And he had other reasons, obvious reasons, why he didn't want to go. But God says that, that he had those there that would be receptive. He had souls there. You see, God did not harden those hearts as Jonah thought they were hardened. There were people that were going to be ready to accept the gospel. God didn't alter their freedom of choice. But there was some good soil there that God knew about, and he told Jonah, hey, go put the seed in there. And, you know, that's how God works with the gospel. God, as we see in the New Testament, doesn't save anybody directly from heaven, and that's why we should not be teaching this idea of a sinner's prayer uh, and asking the Lord to save us directly from heaven. He didn't do that in New Testament times. He doesn't do that today. He does it through the gospel. He does it through the gospel, as he did with uh, the first convert that we know of from Philippi, uh, who was Lydia. So she heeded the things that were spoken by Paul, the gospel, and when she and her household noticed this, that the first thing that we're told, we're not told all the things that were spoken by Paul to her. But isn't it very interesting that after he spoke those things, the first response that we see from Lydia, after her heart was opened, after the seed of the gospel was planted, she and her household were baptized. Notice no sinner's prayer was said. Notice there was no direct operation of the Holy Spirit placed upon her heart that forced her or that compelled her. She was simply taught the gospel by the Apostle Paul. And those words, uh, the words of Paul that he penned by uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit are found in the word of God. And two, when it drops in our honest hearts, 
we can be pleasing to God. We can become a Christian or we can be edified in the most holy faith. Well, after she was baptized, the Bible said that, um, uh, that her house was an invitation for them to come and stay, and they were persuaded to do just that. It happened then as, uh, uh, as they were going on their way that uh, a certain slave girl, verse 16, that was possessed by a spirit of divination. It was an evil spirit. And, and, and we have uh, indicated many times when we see this word spirit, we are to think of, of the mind. There was a mindset in this girl in the form of a demon. Demon possession was... Um, uh, was the case in the first century, and, and, it, and it took a miracle to uh, put a demon in a person, and it took a miracle to extract that demon. And so um, there was this girl, this slave girl. She had masters. She was working for these men, and her spirit of divination, she was basically a fortune teller, and that fortune teller was uh, lining the pockets of her masters. And the girl would be following Paul and Silas and notice Luke was around because uh, the pronoun us is used. And uh, the girl was crying out saying, these men, speaking of Paul and Silas, Luke, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And not only would she say that, but she would also be telling fortunes. So the fact that she was able to proclaim that, that Paul and Silas were, were giving the way of salvation along with her crooked uh, fortune telling, which by the way, uh, very much displeases God, um, that would be drawing crowds. But you know, there are some ways that God doesn't want crowds drawn. God wants crowds drawn by the gospel. He doesn't want crowds drawn by fantastic secular ways, even under the guise of teaching the gospel or of worship. And you know, it's a sad thing, very sad indeed in our day and time, when people are being drawn into worship services by every worldly secular way that man can devise to call them in. And so, Paul was getting very perturbed here. Yes, no doubt he was glad that people were coming, but he was not glad at all in the ungodly way that they were being drawn and what was happening when they did, uh, when they did come. And so he says in verse 18, This she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, Notice he doesn't turn and say to the girl because the girl was, was being forced by this demon, by this spirit, by this mind of divination to do what she was doing. Now, there is no demon possession today. There is nothing inside of us in a literal, miraculous way that would be making us do good or would be making us do evil. We choose but in the day of demon possession, many times the people that were, were possessed were at the control of the demon. So Paul, being greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit. That's the spirit of divination. It's not her human spirit, and it wasn't certainly the Holy Spirit, but said to the spirit of, uh, of divination, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out at that very time. When her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone. I tell you what, there have been over the years so much uh, money distortion, extortion, laundering, all under the guise of the gospel that it is certainly amazing. Same was the case in the first century. Same was the case during the ministry of Jesus. Many times he had to deal with money and the improper use of it. And here it is again. People were trying to profit from the gospel. 
So when they saw that their, uh, that their way of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they, they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. But what these men didn't know at this time was not only were they Jews, they were Romans. Paul was a Roman citizen, and they are going to retrace their, uh, their uh, idea here quickly when they will find out that they are Roman citizens. They said they're teaching customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe, which was not true. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes. They commanded them to be beaten with rods, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Oh, God's providence is working here as the Philippian church is being established, and the next convert is going to be this jailer, all because of isolation all because of plague-like conditions, all because they were brought into a place where they could focus and God would use that situation to bring great good. And later, uh, approximately 10 years later, when Paul would be in prison again, he's going to write back this thank you letter to the congregation at Philippi, and it's going to be really exciting when we study this book, what all he says from a context of isolation. Well, our time is about gone. We'll pick up here in Acts chapter 16 and finish the establishment of the church at Philippi with the Philippian jailer. Then we'll go into the text uh, of the book of Philippians and we'll look at that great book. And I hope that you will plan to be with us at a particular time uh, after five o'clock on Wednesdays uh, to, to join us in this study. And I hope that it will bless your life. And until uh, uh, we bring another lesson, which will be on Sunday, I hope you stay safe and sound. Uh, listen to the uh, orders from... Uh, from our government, and let's try to end this thing as soon as we can so we can be back together and have that great reunion day. What a reunion, what a gathering that truly is going to be. I miss you all, and I love you, and I hope God's blessings to be, to be upon each and every one of you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining in, and we'll see you next time.